Okay, we would like to thank and acknowledge our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star Monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields hands off at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. All right, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, let's get started. Today, we are lucky enough to be hearing from Dr. David Whelan, who is a professor at Austin College and the leader of the AAVSO Spectroscopy Observing Section. If you attended the Sacramento Mountain Spectroscopy Workshop in 2019 or tuned into last year's Digital AAVSO Spectroscopy Workshop, you might remember Dr. Whelan. His talks are always the highlight of any event, but he's not the only bright star in today's webinar. Joining him today are two of his students, Megan Frank and Jessica Junginer. Last fall, they worked on a project together in order to get some new insights into one of the brightest and most famous variable stars in the sky. Personally, I can't wait to hear about it. So without any further ado, let's turn it over to the experts. Here you go. Thank you, Lauren. You can hear me okay? Yep. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen now. And past experience means it's gonna take a few moments for it to load. So just hang tight for a moment. All right, no worries. We can see it now. We can now um, see your screen share. Wonderful. And I'm gonna to go to presentation mode. So we are ready to go. Excellent, thank you. Uh, thanks again to Lauren for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am very happy to be sharing this, uh, this presentation with my two students um, who worked on this project with me throughout the fall semester of 2020. Um, I'm going to detail um, everything that we have learned about ALGOL and uh, concentrate on the, the questions that we are trying to answer and our results. Um, but I wanted to start with an introduction about my science, what it is that I do, and why it is that I was attracted to this particular project. I'm a stellar spectroscopist, and so when I do research with my students, we use our on-campus observatory in order to take spectra of stars and try to learn something about those stars. And this semester, this past semester, I decided to focus on something that I haven't done in the past, which is uh, focus on a very bright eclipsing binary star. Um, one of the things that drew me to this was the uh, fact that it's actually a triple system, and I will go into that in some more detail here. Um, but for the purposes of this uh, presentation and the reason that I wanted to present it at uh, the, double, uh, the AAVSO um, uh, webinar series here is this is a bright star that could easily be observed um, with your own equipment uh, if you have access to a spectrograph. Um, and so if it's something that you've never thought of doing before, to study eclipsing binary stars, um, then maybe this is the, the push in the right direction that, uh, that you need in order to begin to investigate them. It turns out that just like ALGOL, which is a, a bright second magnitude star in the sky, there are any number of mysteries uh, in, the, in the bright sky uh, that require um, people to uncover and, and investigate. And eclipsing binary stars are an excellent way to begin those kinds of investigations. So I hope that this is an inspiration to you. Even if it isn't, just sit back and enjoy the research that we were able to put together. Um, 
We will be taking questions um, uh, at the end of the talk. Um, and so put them in the Q&A, just like Lauren said, and uh, we will get to them uh, as, as, as is appropriate at, at, the, at the right time. So the subject today is to um, classify algal C. And what I have here is an interferometric observation of the algal system with all three known stars in the system labeled. Algal A is over here. That's the brightest star in the system. It's closely orbited by Algol B, which is eclipsing it. And for most of uh, human history, when there has been known to be a change in brightness of Algol, um, it's been a, a signature of just these two stars. But it was uh, less than 100 years ago that Algol C was discovered spectroscopically. And uh, since then, uh, we have tried to learn some, some facts about it, but it hasn't always been easy to uncover uh, some of the basic physical characteristics of this star. And that is what is driving our research today. One thing I want to make clear to you from this, uh, this uh, figure is that uh, on the y-axis is the declination axis and on the x-axis is the right ascension. And you'll notice that the units are milli arc seconds. That's thousandths of an arc second. So every single one of these little tick marks is one thousandth of an arc second. So that means that this frame is only 20, arc, uh, 20 milli arc seconds on a side or one fiftieth of a second. And as you know, the seeing disk, because of the atmosphere, is usually larger than one arc second. And that means that these three stars are so close together that we cannot possibly hope to separate the light from each of these stars individually using relatively modest sized telescopes and spectrographs. So the light that's coming to us from Algol is all mixed up. We receive simultaneously the light from Algol A, Algol B, and Algol C. And as spectroscopists, it's our job to somehow figure out how to separate the light from all of those components in order to study them individually. So that's really what I'm gonna be presenting about today. But to begin, I think it's appropriate to look at what's most well known about the system, and that's the eclipsing binary pair, Algols A and B. So what I'm showing here is an image that was created by uh, Michael Guidry at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. And he's showing several things in this diagram. And so I wanna go through them slowly one by one. Up here in the upper left-hand corner, you see an ellipse, which is showing the orbit of the two stars. And the two stars are labeled Algol B, which is the yellow star with the K2 in its, uh, on it, and Algol A, which is the blue star labeled B8. B8 and K2 are their spectral types. And so they give us a, an idea of their temperature. B8 is a pretty, uh, high temperature, relatively speaking, and so it, it would in fact appear blue or white to us, whereas K2 is a relatively cool spectral type, actually cooler than the sun, and so it would appear yellowish or even orange to our eye. And in this orientation with Algol A in front of, but not completely covering, Algol B, this is what is known as secondary eclipse. That is, the brighter of the two stars, Algol A, is eclipsing the dimmer of the two stars, Algol B. On the right-hand side here, you have Algol B, which you'll remember is the dimmer star, now blocking quite a bit of Algol A, but not entirely blocking it, right? And when it's in this orientation with Algol B in front of Algol A, this is called primary eclipse. On this light curve, the lower left-hand corner here, you have apparent magnitude plotted versus time, and primary eclipse is shown as these great big dips in apparent magnitude. And what that means is that you're blocking out a great deal of light from Algol A, the brighter of the two stars. And you can see that between primary eclipses, it's less than three days. It's about 2.8, 2.9 days. And so it takes these two stars just less than three days to orbit entirely around one another. And halfway between primary eclipses, you also get a secondary eclipse. That should all geometrically make sense. If you were to take a zoom in of these two stars and really look at them closely, this is actually a pretty good representation of what they might look like, minus this dotted line here. This dotted line represents the Roche lobe of Algol A. And for those who are not familiar with this terminology, a Roche lobe is demarcated by the um, equipotential around a, a star, and it always forms a figure eight around close binary uh, pairs. What you'll notice is that Algol B, the K2 star, the um, larger but dimmer star in the pair, actually fills its Roche lobe. And that's because it's an evolved star. It's actually evolved off of the main sequence. 
and it's filling its Roche lobe as a result. But because it fills its Roche lobe entirely and even uh, reaches the crossing point here, uh, some little bit of matter is actually trailing in and forming a disk around algal A, which eventually creates onto algal A. So algal A over time is gaining mass, algal B is, um, is losing mass. The red X here shows the center of mass of the system. And so you can see that most of the mass is actually in algal A, which is why the center of mass is so close to the center of algal A. Now that you have some idea of the basics of how the uh, algal system works, um, I want to give you some of the known information about these uh, stars in a table form. Some people find this easier to look at. What I'm giving here are uh, the three stars in the system, algals A, B, and C. And then in the second uh, column, I will present their spectral types, their known spectral types. And then I'll present their temperatures, their radii in units of solar, and their masses in units of solar. And I'm even providing you with the references, should you be uh, interested in, in looking that up later. In terms of spectral type, uh, algal A has been of a known spectral type for a very long time. And that's because Morgan, when he was first putting together his classification scheme, actually used algal A as one of his standard stars. Now, at that time, he had no knowledge of algols B and C. So all he had was the spectrum of a B8 star that he defined as a B8 star. So calling algol A a B8 star is sort of redundant. It is the definition of a B8 five star, a B8 main sequence star. The spectral type of uh, algol B was more difficult to determine because it's a much dimmer star. Uh, it's been determined to be a K2 type star, as I've mentioned before, which is um, cooler than the sun. And this Roman numeral four represents the fact that it is a subgiant luminosity class. So it has evolved off of the main sequence. Main sequence is represented by the Roman numeral five in the spectral type here. In terms of known physical parameters, uh, star A has a temperature, a temperature at its surface of 12,500 degrees. By comparison, the sun has a temperature of less than 6,000 degrees. So this is more than twice as hot as the sun is. It's also 2.7 times the radius of the sun, so physically much larger than the sun. And that's because, of course, it has a much greater mass. It has more than three times the mass of the sun. Mass estimates vary for algol A. Um, in the literature, you might find um, uh, estimates as high as 3.7 or 3.8 solar masses. It all sort of depends on how you measure things. Um, we take, took this from a particular study, the Barron study, um, that uh, we, we trust. And so we feel like this is probably a, a really close representation of the truth. Uh, Algo B, by comparison, is about 4,900 degrees. So that's cooler than the sun. Uh, but you'll notice that its radius is actually larger than Algol A's. So it's a physically larger star, even though its mass is actually quite a bit smaller. 0.7 solar masses compared to 3.2. Um, the reason why it's so much dimmer is because it has such a low temperature. When a star is emitting light, if it has a low temperature, it also has a low flux. It is not producing very much energy. Whereas the higher the temperature, the more light it actually produces. So a hotter star actually produces more light and therefore algal A is by far the brightest star in this system. Now I've started by showing you the parameters of algols A and B because these are the easiest to know because they actually eclipse one another. By studying that eclipse, one star passing in front of another one and studying how the light dips over time, you can actually learn a lot about, for instance, the physical size of the star, the temperature of the star, and because of the uh, orbital motion, even the masses of the star. Um, Algol C, on the other hand, is much further away than these other two stars. It does not eclipse either Algol A or Algol B, and therefore is much more difficult to determine um, its basic information. That said, there are some guesses about its, uh, its basic parameters. And to the best of our knowledge, we think that its surface temperature is around 7,500 degrees, that its radius is about 1.7 times the mass of the sun, and that its mass is about uh, 1.8 times the mass of the sun's. Now, uh, these parameters would place it, oh, if you were going to compare it to normal stars, uh, in the A range or the F range. Uh, so for those who are not familiar, the, there's a spectral sequence, O, B, A, F, G, K, and M type stars. The O type stars are the hottest. 
the B-type stars, of which Algol A is a prime example, are the next hottest. Then there are the A-type stars, the F-type stars, the G-type stars, which is like the sun, the K-type stars like Algol, uh, Algol B, and then the coolest type of stars are the M-type stars. Uh, a star of about 7,500 degrees at its surface would be right at the edge between um, F and A types. And so there's been a lot of, um, a lot of a lot of research into what the spectral type is and what are these main parameters. Really, it boils down to two possible choices. And the fact is that we don't really know yet what is the spectral type. Is it what's called an AM star or is it what's called an F1 five star? So an F1 five star would be a main sequence star with an F1 spectral type, which matches perfectly to the surface temperature and these sizes. But you might not be as familiar with this AM star, this AM designation. What is an AM star? An AM star is a, usually an A-type star, but they can also be F-type stars that are called metallic line A-type stars. And the idea behind a metallic line A-type star is that there is a mismatch between the strengths of the um, metal lines in the spectrum and the hydrogen lines in the spectrum, meaning they look like they have different spectral types. And I'm gonna show you an example of what these spectra look like so that you have a feeling for this and have an understanding from, uh, of, of, of how we're conducting our research. But how we determine spectral types is we take a spectrum and we look at absorption lines and we try to see which lines match with which, which, which spectral types and then we assign the spectral type accordingly. But for an AM star, it's very difficult because the metal lines, things like iron um, or calcium or magnesium lines uh, have different strengths than you would expect uh, based on the hydrogen line strengths. And so there's a mismatch. The other thing that defines an AM star is that the calcium K line, which is a line I will show to you specifically, uh, oftentimes a very good indicator of spectral type is very, very small compared to uh, what the other uh, metal lines would suggest. And so there's a big mismatch with the calcium K line. There's also a mismatch between the, uh, the calcium, or sorry, the, the metal lines and the hydrogen lines, and so that's what defines an AM star. It was first determined that Algol C had the spectrum of an, uh, an AM star back in 1964. Fletcher was using photographic plates to take his spectra back then, so they actually used a photographic emulsion on a glass plate. They showed this, uh, the spectra da spectrum down on it, and then they had to uh, develop that film on top of that glass plate. And then he had to digitize that plate in order to try to understand what was the spectral type of Algol C. Very hard work to do 60 years ago. Um, it's actually not too much easier now, although now we have CCDs. So the, uh, we don't have to worry about all that, um, that photographic plate stuff that he had to. Um, but one of the things that he found in particular was that the calcium K line was much smaller than it should be for Algol C. And that's one of the main reasons why he called it an AM star. It's interesting to note that in Richard's 1993 paper, she specifically says that she sees no evidence of that. And so she calls it a borderline AM star and actually labels it an F15. Um, and so really the whole question today boils down to the simple question of, okay, we know everything on this diagram, right? We know everything on this table, except for one thing. Is it an AM star? or is it an, a normal F-type star? And you may be wondering, who cares? And I can understand that point of view. It's actually re really important from one uh, perspective. Well, one is if you're actually just interested in algal, you want to know the answer. And that's one way of looking at it. But if you want to look at it more globally, we want to know, we want to understand where do AM-type stars come from? we can guess the age of algal based on the binary system, the fact that the algal B system is evolutionarily evolved, uh, evolved uh, past the main sequence. And so we can hazard a guess as to how old algal C is, assuming that all three stars were born at the same time. If there's an age determination on its AM type, that could tell us something about the evolution of AM type stars. If it's a normal star, that also says something. So it's actually a larger question when it comes down to it. So I'm gonna take this information and put it into a graphical setting for those of you who are visual people. Uh, this is from a different paper by the same Richards as in the last uh, uh, table. And um, it shows many of the same things that we saw in the earlier graphic. You have algal B um, filling its Roche lobe. 
providing a gas stream onto algal A here. It even shows the disk of material as an annulus around algal A there. You see the dotted line that represents the Roche lobe, just as I mentioned before. She even labeled a little point where the, the gas sort of backs up behind the stream uh, in this transient disk. Uh, and she puts down star spots on the, uh, the surface of algal B, which is, we believe to be true. There are lar large star spots on the surface, probably due to the strong magnetic fields. But what I really like about this diagram is that she also put uh, algal C on here. And for size comparison, she put it as the correct size. So you can see that algal C is quite a bit smaller than either algal B or algal A, quite a bit smaller indeed. And she's put an arrow here to show that it's 144 times algal A's radius away. So it would be way off this diagram in actual fact uh, if you could put it to scale. But this just gives you an idea of uh, what the, the algal system would look like if you could put all the pieces together physically. So now I've given you an idea for the question that we're trying to answer. What is the, uh, the spectral type of algal C? I've given you an idea of what the whole system is like, algals A and B in their close eclipsing orbit, uh, algal C way out there in the netherworlds that's uh, really hard to detect and how on earth are we ever gonna determine its spectral type? So wouldn't it be nice if we could just take this interferometric data and put our spectrograph slit right over algal C only and just collect its light? But as I mentioned, that's impossible, right? The light that's coming to us from these stars is all mixed up. So algal A, algal B, algal C, all of its light is coming to our telescope at exactly the same time. And we have no way of separating it like Baron did in this beautiful work. We have to go with a spectrum. And this is actually a very powerful method. So what I'm gonna do first is introduce you to a basic spectrum with a whole bunch of lines labeled. I'm gonna take my time with this so that you get uh, acquainted with it. Uh, some people who have seen my talks before will recognize these kinds of plots or anybody who's interested in spectral classification. On the y-axis, I have put the rectified intensity and that has a very specific meaning. So in actual fact, the continuum of the star would have some kind of slope to it. What we've done is we've fit that continuum and we've divided by it so that the continuum has a one level. So that way we're only focusing on the lines and the relative sizes of all the lines. So that's what rectified intensity means. We're only looking at the lines and we're plotting that versus wavelength. The wavelength is given in angstroms. Uh, the angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. And that means that 4,000 angstroms is 400 nanometers, which is roughly the edge of what's humanly visible. Uh, and it goes up here to about 4950 angstroms. So we're going from the ultraviolet over here at 3850 angstroms all the way to 4950 angstroms. And that's the, the um, traditional range. Actually, it's a little longer than the traditional range for spectral typing stars. Um, this is the ultraviolet, as I mentioned, which means that this is very much the violet. This would be dark blue in here. This would be lighter blue. If you've ever had a chance to look through an H-beta filter, it looks like a cool teal color. What I've done here is I've labeled the large lines. Those are all due to hydrogen. That's why the H is there. This is the Balmer series of hydrogen. You have H beta over here. H alpha would be even further to the right, much, much further to the right, way off the screen. H gamma is here right in the middle. Then you have H delta, H epsilon, and over here is H8, which for some reason I forgot to label. You've got here the calcium 2 3934 line. So this number represents the wavelength. So it's at 3934 angstroms. So that's invisible to the naked eye. It's in the ultraviolet. This is the calcium K line that I was referring to before as being so important for distinguishing an AM type star from a normal type star. So we're going to uh, take a closer look at that, uh, that line um, in detail as this talk proceeds. But besides the calcium K line and these hydrogen lines in the spectrum, we have numerous little lines. And I wanna be clear for those who aren't familiar with these kinds of spectra, there's no noise showing in the spectrum, okay? So every single little dip that you see, even if it's really tiny, is actually an absorption line produced in the, the atmosphere of a star. So all of these are spectral signatures from the star and all of them can tell us something about the star. For instance, Here's a helium nine at 4,009 angstroms and another one at 4026. There's helium here at 4121, 4144, 4387, 4471, and all the way over here at 4922. There are helium lines throughout the spectrum. 
Helium lines are by definition only found among the B-type stars. So this has already taught us something very important. When we take a, a spectrum of the algal system, which we know to be dominated by algal A's light, we can see spectral signatures that must be coming from algal A because that's the only star in the system that's hot enough to produce these lines. So all of the helium lines are from algal A. The depth of the hydrogen lines also indicates that this is a B8 star. So these must be mostly at least due to the algal A star. Actually, the same goes for almost the all the rest of these lines too. There's a carbon two line here at 4267, uh, titanium two, iron two, those are singly ionized atoms of uh, iron, titanium, and carbon. Uh, there's a singly ionized silicon line here, a singly ionized magnesium line here. All of those are also going to be found in algal A's atmosphere. So it looks like for all intents and purposes that we're really only seeing lines due to the brightest star in the system. Except if we look really closely, there are several small lines that could not possibly exist in a star that is this hot. I take, for example, the manganese 4030 line. It's a little tiny line. It's barely visible right here on the side of the helium line right next to it. Very, very difficult to see. You can sort of see it as a little bump. Then you have an iron line here poking out at 4046. That's a neutral iron line. You have a tiny calcium one line here. You have a tiny cal uh, iron line here. Um, these lines that are due to neutral species could not normally be produced in the atmosphere of a star as hot as algal A. And so they're the oddballs. And in fact, they are the signatures that something else is going on beyond just algal A being the only star in the system. Those are the spectral signatures that uh, uh, show us that there is more than one star contributing to the light. And as actually I'm going to show you, those lines in particular come from algal C. So we do actually see some evidence, even at this point, that algal C is hiding in the murk. Okay, what I'm going to do now is show you a, uh, an animation. And this animation was produced by one of my two students. This animation was produced by Jessica. She's waving at you now. Um, she is a brilliant person with putting together things to make animations. And uh, when I suggested this idea to her, she fell into it with both feet and very quickly put together this wonderful animation that shows the spectrum that we secured with our observatory, along with this uh, animation of two stars going in orbit around one another. So these two stars represent algals A and B. Now, you'll notice that they're not actually algal A and B because they produce a full eclipse of one another. And as we know, that's not the case for algal. We found this on Wikimedia Commons, this, this uh, animation, and we think it's uh, really stupendous. And so we decided to use it to illustrate what's going on with our spectra. And so what we did is we took spectra of algal at every 10th of an orbital phase from zero or one to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and one again. And one is primary eclipse. That is when algal B passes in front of algal A. That means 0.5 here is when algal A passes in front of algal B. And then you just go in the cycle again and again and again. And what this animation allows us to do is to see how the spectrum changes as the orbit changes for algals A and B. Now keep in mind that this isn't the full look, right? We're not seeing algal C in this animation, right? So it's still out there. And you can think that algal C is always producing the same amount of light and is always contributing the same amount to the spectrum. The only thing that's changing is whether or not algal A or algal B is an eclipse. And what you'll see, boom, is that during primary eclipse, the spectrum changes a lot. So I'm going to shut up for a moment, and I'm going to allow you to just stare at this and absorb it for a couple of cycles.
I'm sure you are all very keen sighted and you have noticed small changes to the spectrum outside of primary and secondary and eclipse. And those may or may not be just artifacts of the way that we did the continuum rectification. Um, but what's really important, of course, is that during primary eclipse, you see a whole bunch more lines than you saw previously. So if I can go back to my original slides here, let me now go back to presentation mode and show you those two spectra that I think are the most worthy of focusing on for, uh, for this discussion, which is one outside of eclipse and one inside of primary eclipse. It's amazing how much this spectrum has changed. And once again, I want to point out that you're not seeing noise with all of these lines. These are spectral signatures that are due to the star. And you'll notice a couple of really big changes. Here's the calcium K line that I mentioned before. Outside of eclipse, it looks moderately small. Inside of eclipse, it's significantly stronger. Here are the two helium lines, which uh, are very strong for algal A. And you'll notice that during primary eclipse, when algal A is largely covered up, one of them has completely been lost in the noise and the other is quite a bit smaller. Likewise, the helium lines here and here become smaller. The helium line here becomes smaller. This complex right here is quite interesting because it had a little iron line and a helium line superposed. And outside of eclipse, the helium line is strong. Inside of Eclipse, the helium line is weaker and the iron line on top is quite a bit stronger. Here, this also had an iron line and a, a helium line, but the helium line becomes much weaker and so it looks more pointed from the iron line during the eclipse. All of these spectral signatures that are popping out in this spectrum that were less visible outside of Eclipse, those spectral signatures are by and large coming from algal C. So we have the information we need now in order to try to remove just the contribution from algal C from the system so that we can get a spectrum of algal C all by itself. And that's really exciting. So that's what we're gonna to try to do now. But before I do that, I'm actually gonna take a slight interlude and that's to show you how we did some of this research uh, because how on earth would we know when to take spectra of algal at every tenth of an orbital phase from primary eclipse through secondary eclipse and all the way back around again? This is where the Sky and Telescope magazine really came to our aid. This is freely available to anybody on the web, skyandtelescope.org slash observing slash the minima, well, it's covered up for me, um, but you can see it there, the minima of algal. Um, and uh, what you do is there's a nice description inside of this uh, website and you enter a date in there and it provides you with the dates for primary eclipse for the next eight cycles of the, of the period's rotation. And by doing that, uh, you can know when to observe it if you wanna see it at primary eclipse, but you can also uh, interpolate between any two values of minimum in order to determine any uh, tenth of a phase uh, where you'd like to observe from. And uh, in order to, to do that, uh, my other student, Megan, uh, put together, uh, she's waving at you now, um, she put together an observing plan for us because uh, this was actually quite a difficult thing to put together. You do it for multiple cycles. We actually did it for two months, Megan, three months, something like that. I mean, you put a lot of time into making sure that we had all of the times labeled because just because it's minimum doesn't mean it's gonna be visible to you. And in the fall months, Algol didn't even rise until later in the night. So we were often going up to the telescope at 3 a.m. to you know, observe a phase of 0.3. Uh, and then you know, two days later, oh, we'd finally have an opportunity to observe it at a different phase, but it would be at midnight instead. Uh, we had to determine when were the appropriate times to, to find it when it was actually up in the sky and at the appropriate uh, phase angles that we wanted it to be. That's all observing planning, right? That is a complicated thing to do. Uh, Megan was the champion here. Uh, and without that, we would not have been able to have such a beautiful data set with which to make the animation that Jessica uh, made uh, that you saw earlier. So I wanted to show you just a little bit about how uh, what goes into making these kinds of observations if you too are interested in exploring the world of eclipsing binaries, which I would highly recommend. We've had a great time. Um, but I also want to uh, show you a little bit about our observatory because um, my experience teaches me that people who come to these kinds of things love to see 
the, the kinds of equipment that people use. And for those of you who are spectroscopists, in fact, you might recognize the spectrograph that we have on the back of our telescope. So this is our telescope mirror up here. It's a 24 inch telescope and I'll get to that in a moment, but right here at the back end of, um, of, of our telescope is the L high res, which is a spectrograph made by Shelliac Instruments out of France. Um, and so there's our beautiful little L high res uh, spectrograph which, with which we've taken all of the spectra that you have so far seen in this, this talk. And attached to that is our uh, CCD camera. Um, we do not benefit from the sort of small telescopes that this spectrograph was designed for, uh, but because our telescope is a little bit larger and we have an F8 focal ratio, um, our disk size is quite large and so we needed larger pixels. And so this is a Finger Lakes instrumentation microline camera with 13.5 micron pixels, uh, which was required in order to uh, secure our data. Uh, so that's the spectroscope and our um, camera. And here is a picture of our telescope. It is designed by DFM Engineering out of Colorado. Uh, and some of you might recognize these yellow orange forks. Uh, it's the same for his telescopes around the world. Uh, here's the telescope itself. Uh, the mirror sits down here. It's in the, the Cassegrain focus. So there's a secondary mirror here. There's a hole in the primary mirror and everything goes to the back side of the primary mirror, which is of course where the spectrograph is. And you can see it right there where my mouse is. Okay, enough about the fun instrument stuff. Let's get back to the science. So we now know that we can see spectral signatures from algal C. The only question that remains is how on earth are we going to separate it out from the rest of this, the, the spectral signatures from algals A and B? Okay, so trial and error taught us that we are going to use our raw spectra, not our rectified spectra. When we tried to do the subtraction with our rectified, which means you know, flat continuum spectra, we immediately began to see problems where too much is being subtracted away from one side of the spectrum and not enough is being subtracted away from the other side of the spectrum. And we realized, duh, that if algal C has a temperature of 7,500 degrees, which I showed you earlier, uh, and that's significantly different from algal A's 12,500 degrees, then they're going to have different slopes. So of course, inside and outside of eclipse, you should expect the spectrum to have a different slope. And of course, that's what you see here. This top spectrum in red is phi of 1.0. That means that we're dealing with primary eclipse. This spectrum down here is secondary eclipse, phi of 0 0.5. You can see the lines are quite different because algal A is dominating here. Algal A is still dominating here, but there's quite a con contribution from algal C here. But you can also see that the slopes are quite a bit different for these two stars because you have subtracted away a good deal of the brighter star's light. So we have to allow for that. Um, spectral gradient across the, the spectrum. We chose for this to use only two spectra, the spectrum at primary eclipse, which is when algal C is most visible, so that's going to be our primary spectrum, and our spectrum at secondary eclipse. Now the idea is going to be here that we are going to subtract away one spectrum from another. So why choose the spectrum at secondary eclipse? Okay, the spectrum at secondary eclipse means that algal A is in front of algal B and blocking about 60% of its light. When you block 60% of the light, that means that algal B is contributing such a tiny amount to the light that it's practically negligible. You don't have to worry about algal B anymore. And that means that at secondary eclipse, you're really only dealing with algal A's light and a tiny bit of light from algal C, okay? And actually the ratio there is something like 95% to 5%. So the vast majority of light from primary or secondary eclipse is algal A's light. So we have made the assumption, it's very important to always list your assumptions, we have made the assumption that at secondary eclipse, it is entirely algal A's light. And then at primary eclipse, it is both primary, it, it is both algal A and algal C light. And so what we want to do, we're ignoring algal B. There's a good reason for that. It contributes so little light, it's not important. Um, the goal, therefore, is to subtract away one spectrum from another so as to sub uh, subtract away only the contributions from algal A from the spectrum. And that should leave us with nothing more than algal C's spectrum. I hope that makes sense. So we have to scale them appropriately in order to do that, right? Because the question then is how much of a primary eclipse is algal A's light contributing to, right? And then of course we finally subtract the spectrum. 
So that's the method. For those of you who don't like mathematics or algebra, close your eyes now. We have to show you how do we do the scaling. Uh, we started with Kim 1989, which is a paper on the photometry of algol, very useful. And he showed that during primary eclipse, delta B, that is the change in the B band magnitude was 1.2 magnitudes. And here's the figure from his paper. I've given you the full citation here, Astrophysical Journal, volume 342, page 1061. Because when I looked up Kim on uh, NASA ADS, there were about a, you know, two dozen papers uh, by different people named Kim. And so I didn't want you to have to sift through that like I did. So this is the paper for those of you who want to investigate the beautiful work that Kim did in 1989. But this change in B-band magnitude is useful to us. I chose the B-band and not the V-band magnitude shown in this plot because V-band is outside of the spectral range that we're looking at. But B-band is inside the spectral range. So it's going to be a pretty close approximation to what is actually happening within our spectral band. 1.2 magnitudes of difference between uh, normal and primary eclipse means that about 70% of algal A's light is being blocked. And I could show you the math of the logarithms in order to figure that out, but I don't feel like I want to put people to sleep. So we're going to skip that right now. The important thing, and here's the algebra, is that you can look at this from a really simplistic point of view, that the total light, that is L total, is always going to be a contribution of algal A's light plus algal B's light plus algal C's light. So outside of eclipse, you've got the light from all three stars adding up to your total light. At primary eclipse, you have algal B and algal C's light still there, but you've removed 70% of algal A's light, leaving 30% behind. So 0.3% of LA, that is the light from algal A, remains during primary eclipse. So far, so good. You could do the same exercise for uh, secondary eclipse. You remove 60% of algal B's light. That means 40% is remaining. This is the algebra we need to know in order to know how to scale the two spectra that we are hoping to subtract from one another. Uh, the only thing that remains, therefore, is to have some estimates for LA, LB, and LC, the amounts of light for algals A, B, and C. Enter Colbus et al., 2015, a paper that I can highly recommend to you. They do make a spectrum for algal C in a completely different method. They used high-resolution spectra, and they used the Doppler method, meaning they saw the stars moving with respect to one another, and their, therefore their absorption lines were moving with respect to one another. And they found all the lines that were moving together, and they separated them from one another. So they were able to determine uh, spectra separately from algals A, B, and C, a beautiful pa uh, paper to compare to. And actually, our results confirm what they also published. But for the purposes of the scaling, um, they were able to show to us that LA, that is the light from algal A, contributes 94.3% of the light of the system. Okay, so I want to make that absolutely clear to you. Algal A, by far, is the brightest star in the system. 0.943 uh, of the total light, that is 94.3% of the total light of the system. Algal B is less than 1% of the light, 0.8% of the total amount of light, which is why I've ignored it in our analysis. And algal C, which is 4.9% or about 5%, like I said earlier. So we use these numbers on the right-hand side. We use these formula, formulae on the left-hand side, and we get that in primary eclipse, algal A is still contributing 88% of the total light of the system. So 70% of its light is blocked, but it's still contributing 88% of the light of the system. That's how bright it is, OK? And that's why those Balmer lines are still so booming when we look at the uh, spectrum for uh, primary eclipse, which we can see here. OK. so. What we're going to do now, this is what they look like when they're scaled appropriately after we've done all the algebra. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to subtract away the secondary eclipse spectrum from the primary eclipse spectrum. Drum roll, please. Here's our spectrum for algal C. Boom. OK. Now, when you're doing this in real time, it's really exciting to say, yay, we have a spectrum from algal C. But then you have to come back and you have to be serious about this because you have to question is it actually a spectrum of algal C? And there's a couple of ways of knowing that, OK? Let's take a look. OK, I've labeled some lines for you to help you out. You can see that the Balmer lines are still there, but they're a great deal weaker than they were previously. OK, that's a good sign. That means we've removed a lot of the light from, from algal A. 
you can see that the calcium K line over here is quite strong, also a good sign because that's sort of the change that we were seeing during primary eclipse anyway. So, okay, that's, that's looking pretty good. Now you'll remember the telltale signs of um, algal A throughout the spectrum were the helium lines. There were two helium lines here at 4009 and 4026 angstroms. There were helium lines here at 4121 and 4144, 4387 and 4922. Now you tell me, do you see any of those helium lines? Because I don't. Woohoo! We think we have actually subtracted away really the light from algal A. And the fact that we don't see any residual emission or absorption, I should say, from the helium lines is the biggest indication that we have that this is actually a good spectrum of algal C. Really exciting. That means that we can turn this spectrum over to our spectral typing method and try to determine its classification. Remember, that's the whole point, right? That's what we were setting out to do. So here we are. We've got a spectrum of algal C. And what do we find? OK, so the way that I do spectral classification is I compare a star's spectrum to other spectra of stars of known spectral type. And so what I've done here in the top panel is I've shown two standard stars on either side of our target star. So this is algal, I call it BC, although as you know, algal B is contributing so little light that it doesn't, it's practically neg negligible. So we have algal C's light here, and we're comparing it to an A95 star and an F05 star. And you can see why I've chosen those stars to compare to after a good deal of hunting. There are any number of spectral signatures that really seem to line up very well between these two stars. One of the things that excited me very much was the fact that the calcium K line seemed to match to the strength of the hydrogen lines on either side very well. And that was a big indication to us that this was not an AM star. You might remember from way back at the beginning of my presentation that an AM star, a metallic line A type star, was one in which the calcium K line was much smaller than it should be for a spectral type. Well, this is definitely not an AM star by that definition. And the other thing is that the strength of the hydrogen lines and the strength of the metal lines seem to co coincide fairly well with a couple of small caveats. So F05, when overplotted against algal C, we see that the Balmer lines are all a little bit narrower than the standard star. And what's more to the point, that there seems to be sort of a change across the wavelengths, meaning that it's more narrow here, a little less narrow, a little less narrow, and least narrow of all. That would suggest to us that there's some maybe gradient issue. There's some, there's some issue as if we almost took away too much light over here and, or uh, something. There seems to be some small error still in the spectrum. I'm pretty happy with it at this point, but it's not perfectly great. And I want to do some checks on it. Uh, another thing that sort of bothered me is that this 4030 manganese line was not in really great shape. Uh, that might be due to noise, though. In the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum, the spectra are very close together because the l high res spectrograph uh, uses lenses in order to pass its light um, to the camera. And as a result, it absorbs a lot of ultraviolet light, which means that the signal is always less in ultraviolet light than it is in blue light. And that means that we have an increased noise when we've subtracted two spectra away. And so the seemingly weak manganese line could be an artifact of the noise that's in the spectrum, or it could be in fact too weak. And that would also suggest that we have some kind of slope issue. Um, and so the question is, maybe we wanna try to correct the slope. Why correct the slope? Well, there's one good reason why there actually might be an error to the slope of our spectrum in the raw spectrum. And that is due to atmospheric extinction. When the light comes down uh, from space into the atmosphere and to our telescope, as it passes through the atmosphere, most of the gas is inert. But as you know, there are small particulates in the air. And those particulates can absorb or scatter light away. And because of the size of the particulates, ultraviolet light is scattered more than is blue light, which is scattered more than is red light. So atmospheric extinction is wavelength dependent. That means that it's going to contribute to the slope of our raw spectrum. So if we can correct for atmospheric extinction, we might be able to deal with the slope issue and try this one more time. How do you measure the atmospheric extinction, you ask? Great question. First, 
and foremost, and it would have been sensible if we'd known this from the get-go, which should just do this with algal, but we didn't know that. So what you want to do is observe a single star and multiple air mass values. Now, we didn't have enough spectra to do that with algal, as I just said, and so I had to choose a different star to do this. And this is only a pilot study. So this is sort of like, you know, I wouldn't trust these answers yet, and I haven't quite applied them yet. But one thing that I determined as soon as I started this is I wanted to make sure that the target star that I was choosing was at roughly the same declination as algal itself, and that the weather was appropriately the same, so that I could witness it going through the same portion of the atmosphere. For that same reason, I also wanted to choose a B or an A type star that was nice and hot, therefore had a lot of ultraviolet um, uh, emission so that I could get a really good slope through the ultraviolet. So here is a star that I found at roughly the same declination as algal that I could observe. It's HD 89021. When I did the spectral classification, it turns out to be an A245 star. So it's a little bit larger than a main sequence star at a temperature of a normal A2 star. And so I observe it at one air mass, a high air mass, and then I let it rise a little bit and I observe it at a lower air mass. And you can see that mostly it looks the same, although it does look like the slope has changed a little bit. Uh, the air masses of these two spectra are 1.7 and 1.4. And if the slope is not too obvious at this point for you, I'll draw a line for you. And maybe you can see that in this ultraviolet and blue portion of the spectrum, the higher air mass slope appears to be steeper than does the lower air mass portion, uh, the same portion of the spectrum. So what we can do is we can divide these two continua, the one at low air mass divided by the one at higher mass. This ratio is going to be proportional, roughly speaking, to what's called the absorption coefficient, which is wavelength dependent. And we can see that there's a very clear dependence on wavelength for the absorption coefficient. This is a good sign, okay? So this is not a complete analysis at this point, but we know now that in order to do this appropriately, we will need on the 40% level to make a correction to our spectra before we do the subtraction to get the spectrum from algal C. I can confidently say that we have a good spectrum of algal C, but it's still a work in progress. So algal C in a nutshell, and just to review for everybody, we have a spectrum. We're really happy with it. It was a semester well spent with uh, two wonderful students who were very willing to put in lots of hours to do this work. And we have determined in my mind, beyond a shadow of a doubt, although I think we still need confirmation on this, that it's not an AM star. The calcium K line is too strong and uh, otherwise it looks perfectly normal. So our answer uh, um, solves an old problem in astronomy. But as I said before, the spectrum is not perfect, and so we need to confirm this. Um, so our next step is going to be to do some air mass correction. And that really is the end of my presentation. I want to say thank you for tuning in today uh, and for listening patiently, and I can't wait to hear your questions. I also want to offer you my slides. And so I know this is being recorded and people will be able to watch it later, but if you'd like these slides, so that this information can become useful to you in your own researches, email me. It's dwhelan at austincollege.edu. And when I receive an email from you, I will send you as an attachment the PDF of my talk today so that you can have access to that. And for those who really do become interested in binary stars, eclipsing binary stars, there is a great resource to begin with if you're wondering which star should I start with. And that is Daniel Popper's 1980 paper. It was a review paper on stellar masses in which he shows very clearly the answer to um, uh, a lot of these eclipsing binaries, which is useful information if you're first starting out. You can go to NASA ABS in order to look for this paper. So I will leave that up and uh, I will um, just sit back and say I'm done. Thank you very much, Dr. Whelan. We've had uh, quite a few questions come in here, so uh, I'll start reading them out now. Uh, first question came in from Celsa Canada, who says that he's working on the Universe Sampler uh, program in the Houston Astronomical Society, and it asks to, for the observer to observe two variable stars and make four brightness estimates of them, and that uh, they want some tips on doing that accurately because it's challenging to determine the brightness of a variable star visually. So if any of you guys have any tips to share. 
So um, my guess, although I don't know the program, is that that's photometry, not spectroscopy. Does that? Uh, sound it's right? actually a visual observing program. I know the woman who created it. Okay, so uh, naked eye then. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, if if you'd like, I can speak to that because I do make those kind of estimates. I Why don't, don't you? Yeah, it sounds like you know more about this than I do. Okay, uh, just for this one then, um, Salsa, try going to the AVSO website. Um, if you scroll down on the front page, then there's going to be a box that kind of towards the middle that says uh, something about get data on a star. Type in the name of the star, and then there should be a button to hit to do, go to the variable star plotter. And that's uh, a chart tool that the AVSO has, and it will generate charts that show your variable star and also nearby stars of a known standard brightness. And then it becomes very simple to make an estimate. You just look at your star and you say, is it brighter than that standard star or is it fainter or is it the same brightness? And you repeat that for a few different standard stars and you can narrow it down really nicely that way. And if you want more help after that, uh, try joining the AVSO because we have a mentorship program where we have people who will help you out with that kind of thing. Okay, uh, next question, John Merle asked, if algal B has evolved, then shouldn't algal, algal A being a hotter star with a short lifespan be further evolved? That is a great question, John. I'm really glad that you asked that question. And this tells us a lot about the history of algal type binaries. There's actually quite a few known binaries out there that seem to defy logic in the way that you've described. That is hotter stars evolve more quickly than cooler stars do. So if you have an eclipsing binary pair of stars where you have a hot star and an evolved cool star, that really doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, especially when the masses are so disparate. Here's the answer. When algal B first started to evolve off of the main sequence, it was actually the larger of the two stars. But it grew to fill its Roche lobe. And because it filled its Roche lobe, it funneled mass onto the little algal A, what we call algal A now. At that time, it was not a B-type star. It was, I don't know, a G-type star or something, but it was quite a bit smaller than it is now. And over the course of the centuries and millennia and probably millions of years, Algol B has slowly been feeding mass onto algal A. So algal A has gotten steadily larger and brighter and hotter as a result of that. Um, and because of this, uh, it's accumulated enough mass at this point that it is probably going to accelerate its own evolution. And it's probably going to eventually um, start uh, uh, evolving off the main sequence itself. And when it does that, it will fill its Roche lobe again and then it will start looking like a peanut. Essentially, it'll feed mass onto algal B, and then you'll have both of them, and they'll both be connected, filling the Roche lobes. Um, and this is what's known as a contact binary, and there are numbers of those examples too. So thanks for that question, John. Great answer, thank you. Uh, we have a related question from Richard Tyson, who said, if algal A is pulling material off of algal B, does that mean that algal A could eventually go nova? That's a great question as well. Um, at this point, algal A's mass is too low for that. A 3.2 solar mass star is never going to go nova. Um, it doesn't have a strong enough gravitational pull in order for a nova to happen in a disk, for instance, like you see sometimes around white dwarfs. Also, it's not uh, massive enough to ever become a supernova, like a core collapse supernova. Instead, it will evolve. Um, it'll eventually swallow algal B and it'll become one star, actually. But even so, it'll eventually become a planetary nebula. And so there won't be any big boom. Uh, sort of like you expect with those uh, other other kinds of uh, novi. Thank you. And we have a question here from Michael Gardner, who has asked if algal C could be a captured star. Um, it certainly could be a captured star. Uh, the answer is that I don't know. Um, if it is a captured star, it could have a very different age from the other two stars in the system. Um, one way to tell is how are the abundances of all of these stars compared to one another? And this is actually, I'm going to point back to the Colbus et al. 2015 paper. Um, and I can go through my slides again to show that to you. Um, just to see how that's spelled, Colbus here. Uh, they did an abundance analysis. And an abundance analysis is useful because the uh, leftover material from a dead star becomes the new material for a, a, a new star. And that means that the new star is uh, more enriched in, in elements than the older star was. And so you can use uh, chemical enrichment in order to trace the ages of a lot of stars. Um, 
I don't remember the answer from Kolbis's paper, but they did do that abundance analysis. Uh, I think really towards the answer to that question is algal C, has it always been a member of the system or is it a relatively new addition? And it's an interesting question, uh, I think for a couple of reasons. One, it would be sort of cool if the star was just sort of floating through space and then got captured. Um, but it actually turns out that a lot of hot stars, and in fact, the majority of hot stars hotter than algal A are found not only in binaries, but even tertiaries, quaternaries, uh, quintuplets. Um, there are multiple systems all over the sky uh, among hot stars. And so uh, in those cases, most of them are actually all born together. Um, and the question is how long do they last in those multiplet systems? Um, so your question actually has a huge amount of importance behind it. And the answer is we don't know yet. Great answer, thank you. All right, I've uh, noticed that we've got a couple of comments coming in asking for you to please um, put your email address up on the screen again for a couple oh. minutes so that people can copy it down. For sure. Thank you. Ta-da. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so um, we have a question here from an anonymous attendee who asked if a coronagraph of the type used to directly observe exoplanets could be used to directly observe algal C and or measure its spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, a coronagraph is often used, as you pointed out, uh, to study exoplanetary systems. Um, and uh, they've also been used in the past before they were ever used for exoplanets in order to study binary star systems. Um, but the difficulty is, and the reason why it hasn't been done yet, is because um, in order for it to be done appropriately, you also need to have a diffraction limited um, a, uh, uh, um, image of the star. And that means adaptive optics. And so if you have your own telescope and you have your own coronagraph, which would be amazing, the light coming down to your telescope is still mixed up by the atmosphere. And to remember that the separation between algol C and algols A and B is tens of milliarc seconds, tiny, tiny, tiny compared to your seeing disk. And so in order to, to, uh, to deal with that issue, you would need actually a very large telescope that is operating at the diffraction limit, which means that adaptive optics are correcting for the atmospheric simulation um, before you can use that coronagraph in order to block out algal A light. But yes, theoretically it's possible. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from another anonymous attendee who has asked if you have made any observations of W Ursae Majoris. Right, a contact binary. So not personally, um, uh, it just hasn't come across my plate really. I, I, I said I'm a stellar spectroscopist, but maybe I should clarify. I'm really interested in um, uh, spectral typing stars. So this kind of work that we did for algal C is my bread and butter, but mostly for B and early A type stars. That's what I'm focusing on at the moment uh, with the hopes of publishing uh, a, an atlas of um, the bright stars in the sky of those in that spectral range. Very nice, thank you. Uh, Celsa Canada has asked if it would be useful to your research to get a spectrum from a telescope in space to avoid the atmospheric extinction effects. Um, Ye yes, for algal, it wouldn't matter, right? Uh, because uh, the diffraction uh, effects, for instance, using Hubble, um, you st are, are still not able to separate out the lights uh, from algal C from the, the rest of the system, um, uh, even at the diffraction limit for, for Hubble. So it, uh, it, it won't matter too much for this particular research, but there are any number of you know, uh, binary systems in which it would just be easier to get a spectrum separately from a space telescope. Um, but I don't have a space telescope, so. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Tim Stone, who has asked uh, if you can share your algal spectrum data because he would like to compare that directly against his own B8 spectra and future algal observations. Um, I'm not going to do that at this time, Tim. Um, and it's only because they haven't been published yet. Um, but. Uh, I think in the future, when my the atlas that I was describing um, previously is made available, I will have no reason not to share the spectra. In fact, it would be very important to do so. Um, so I'll say it this way. I very much uh, have it in my mind to share every single one of my spectra in the future, but not now. Thank you. Um, another question from Tim Stone was, have you estimated the resolution of your spectra? For sure I have. 
we have a slit width of uh, 35 microns and uh, the l high res spectrograph is in litro configuration, which means that there is no magnification of the slit on the CCD. And you'll remember that my pixel size is 13.5 microns. I mentioned that very briefly earlier, and that means that uh, we're covering about 2.6 to 2.7 pixels. We have a spectral range of about 1100 angstroms over 2048 uh, pixels, and so that's a resolution uh, at 2.7 pixels of around 3500 um, uh, down to 2700, depending on the spectral range that we're dealing with. So dispersion per pixel of 0.54, the actual um, uh, uh, resolution in terms of angstroms is cl closer to 1.3 angstroms. Thank you. Um, James Taylor has a question here asking if we know about uh, the orbit of algal C. Yes, we sure do, James. Um, the algal C orbit was determined by a, a couple of people. There was Bob Zavala who published a paper on uh, the interferometric studies of, of um, uh, algal C, but also the Barron paper that I mentioned earlier. They tracked it for several years before publishing the results. And they were able to determine the orbit pretty, pretty uh, keenly. Uh, it's actually been known roughly since the 90s, believe it or not. And it's known to be about a 600 or so day orbit, so almost two years. All right, thanks. Um, another question here from James Taylor asking if the AB system could evolve into a cataclysmic variable eventually, or if the mass is too low. Yeah, I think, um, I think the mass is too low. And I wish I had uh, one of my uh, colleagues from nearby at uh, Commerce who studies um, uh, cataclysmic variables because he would be able to answer that question definitively. But my, my understanding, sort of as I was saying before, is that this, this star system is not massive enough um, to ever become a cataclysmic variable. OK, thank you. And looks like our last question for now is from Tim Stone who has asked if Dr. Whelan can tell us a bit about the Austin College Astronomy Program. Okay, so um, we do have a physics major, um, but we have a telescope on top of our newly built science building. So I'm in my office in what's called the Idea Center. This building was built in 2013. And uh, as part of this wonderful monstrosity that they built us, they also put a telescope uh, on the roof. And uh, they're actually the reason I'm here is because they advertised a position for an astronomer who would know how to use the telescope to pursue their own scholarship, but it also to include students in their research. Um, and so I put my hand up, I sent in my application, um, and I feel very fortunate that they agreed with me that I was the person for the job. Um, that was seven years ago, I guess now, um, and uh, I've been using the telescope ever since. So uh, the students who want to do astronomy um, at Austin College typically go through the physics program. And that's very similar to my uh, start as an undergraduate. When I was an undergraduate, I was also interested in astronomy, uh, but I wanted to be a physics major. Um, there was no astronomy program available at my college either. And so I took all the physics major uh, classes. And actually that was exactly the right thing to do um, because uh, the, the physics knowledge that you get uh, gives you a physical intuition that helps you greatly in your future career. Um, but the kinds of courses that we have available are things like introductory astronomy that's open to everybody, where we have small telescopes to, to take out on the roof for, for, for nights at the observatory. Um, we also, uh, uh, I also teach these research courses like I did for, for Megan and Jessica. Um, and um, I also uh, teach what's called an observation and astronomy course. And that's where I go into excruciating detail on all of the important uh, pieces of information that you never thought were going to be important, but which are absolutely essential in order to get good data at a telescope. Um, and that's for our highest level students. Uh, um, that's a 400 level course. Um, so I hope that gives you some introdu introduction to the kind of astronomy that's being done here. I should also mention that I'm actually not the only person using the telescope. We also have on faculty here at Austin College a planetary astronomer, and uh, his name is David Baker. Um, and he uh, likes to use the telescope specifically for uh, hunting exoplanets. And so he's part of the follow-up program for both TESS and Kepler, if you're familiar with those. TESS, of course, is a space telescope, um, and so is Kepler. Um, I should also say KELT, which is the Kilo Extremely Long, uh, Little Telescope, Kilo Degree uh, Extremely Little Telescope, which does photometry of the night sky every night. Um, and he has helped to uh, confirm a large number of exoplanets at this point, and he includes his students in that research. So we do have multiple offerings in astronomy, which I'm very proud of. 
um, I think we do a very good job. Excellent, thank you. I uh, actually have a question of my own to ask. Uh, okay. You mentioned that by definition, helium is only visible in um, B-type star spectra. Correct. But I seem to recall that wasn't helium first observed in the sun, a G-type star? Uh, yes, and that's actually why it was given its name, Helios. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because Helios, of course, is the sun, and so it was called helium, the spectrum that they had never seen in the lab before, uh, which is great uh, uh, chemical um, history. But practically speaking, the stars are so small, uh, so far away, that for, um, for stars that are cooler than a, a B-type star, um, they produce so little uh, helium absorption so as to be practically invisible, and so you don't normally see it. Okay. Got it. I guess we can get a lot higher resolution on the sun than anything else. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that looks like that is the end of our question. So okay. I'd like to thank you. Sharing. Thank you for uh, presenting today. Oh, my pleasure. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing your time and knowledge, both to you, Dr. Whelan, and also uh, Ms. Frank and Ms. Junior. Sorry for mispronouncing your name. <laughs> John Junior. John um, now, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and cancel this screen share and then put up one of my own. Thank you. Just one moment. There we go. All right. So, thank you once again. And I'd also like to give a final thank you to our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Boyce Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the bright star monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AVSO. Today's webinar has been recorded and the recording will be made available for free on the AAVSO's YouTube channel. Go check it out. You'll find a full library of webinars just like these. And while you're there, please consider subscribing to our channel. Not only will you get a notification every time a new lecture is posted, but by hitting that little subscribe button, you will be increasing our educational reach by making YouTube more likely to suggest our videos to others. It's just one more way that you can help support the AAVSO. Speaking of support, this webinar is being supported by you, the viewer. So please, if you're not a member, join the AAVSO. AAVSO membership comes with a wide array of benefits, including free access to our mentorship program. As I mentioned to Salsa earlier, if you're wanting to become an observer, whether that is spectroscopically or visually or for photometry, our mentors can help you hit the ground running. If you are already an AAVSO member, don't forget to renew your membership. And of course, we would be grateful if you would consider donating to the AAVSO. Every donation matters and goes towards making programs like this come to life. One last thing before you go, after you leave the webinar, you will be automatically directed to a survey. Please do fill it out because we want to hear your feedback. You are more than welcome to fill it out, even if you've already filled out a survey at a past AAVSO webinar because we do read every single response and use them to judge how the webinars are, are going and make some plans that will shape the future of the webinar series. So this is your chance. Do take note that the survey is anonymous. So if you use the survey to ask any questions that you want to receive a direct reply to, make sure that you write down your email address down at the bottom. There's a text box for you to put that in. That way we'll know who to send a reply to. Finally, I would like to extend one last huge thank you to Dr. Whelan, Ms. Frank, and Ms. Stringinger from all of us at the AAVSO. We appreciate you. Thank you for having us.
Thank you very much. Thank you.